Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us on the last day of COP26. And firstly, let me apologise about the delay. We've had every single technical issue that could have gone wrong has gone wrong this morning. Um, and I'm hoping now they're all sorted, so fingers crossed. So welcome to today's session at the Renewable UK Energy UK uh, U uh, Energy Transition Hub. And today we're going to be looking at how the UK is demonstrating the potential for green hydrogen. This is a really timely discussion, as this week we've had the release of the Scottish Government Hydrogen Action Plan. We've got the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for hydrogen, and ITM has just announced a second gigafactory in Sheffield. My name is Jane Cooper. I'm the Director of Regulatory and External Affairs at Ersted. We're the global leader in offshore wind. And today, I'm delighted to announce we are publishing our Phase 2 report of the Gigastack project, and this will be available online. So Gigastack has brought together a consortium of ITM, Ersted, Philips 66 and Element Energy. It's developed a concept for an economically viable renewable hydrogen project at scale. Green hydrogen at scale. So Gigastack, we've been doing the work in the Humber and I'm joined by my colleagues today. And Gigastack couples one of the largest offshore wind farms in the world. It's Hornsey 2, it's off the coast of uh, the Humber. It's coupled to an ITM electrolyzer and it provides green renewable hydrogen to the Philips 66 refinery as an off-taker. And this project is really demonstrating how green renewable hydrogen can support decarbonisation of large industrial clusters throughout collaboration. So to kick us off though, before we introduce the panel, I'd just like to introduce Leah Nietzsche, who's our local MP for Grimsby. If we can go to Leah Nietzsche. Hello, my name is Leah Nietzsche and I'm the Member of Parliament for Great Grimsby. As you can see behind me, we are at Grimsby Docks with the magnificent dock tower behind me. The Humber region, of which Grimsby is one part, is a vast and important industrial base in the UK. But because of our large industries, such as steel production, chemicals and refining, we are also the UK's biggest region for CO2 emissions. That brings with it challenges because our industries in the region are vitally important for levelling up the government's agenda to make sure that we have high quality, high skilled jobs across the UK. But also we want to make sure that we are reaching and potentially exceeding our targets for a reduction of CO2 decarbonisation across the UK. And that's why the Gigastack project is particularly important. It is an exemplar in industry to show how different businesses can come together to come up with solutions. And the Gigastack project looks particularly at production of green and blue hydrogen to be able to reduce our carbon emissions and to be able to have a cleaner, greener industry in the future. I'm really looking forward to seeing the report and I'm sure you are too and this will show us a way forward to a better decarbonised UK and the world. Thank you Leah. And before we move on I'd like to introduce you to our panel. So if I can go to my right. Claire, would you like to introduce yourself? Brilliant, yes. So I'm Claire Jackson. I, um, I lead Hydrogen UK, which is the UK Trade Association for Hydrogen. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of us, uh, there's a really good reason for that. We haven't actually <laughs> launched yet. Um, we're due to do so in a couple of weeks in the House of Commons. Um, the organisation that you may or may not be familiar with is the Hydrogen Task Force, which has been around for 18 months, really sort of leading the debate and trying to push hydrogen forwards in the UK. Thank you, Claire. Alistair. Yep, so my name is Alistair McConville. I'm the project lead for Orsted for the Gigastack project. Um, you may know Orsted uh, as the sort of market leader in offshore wind. Um, and for the last 15 years or so, we've been um, developing uh, the UK offshore wind industry from what was a small, relatively niche and expensive market and transformed it into a thriving industry, which is projected to have over 60,000 jobs by 2030 and is now powering millions of homes all over the country. As we look to the future, um, we're keen to explore the opportunity for renewable hydrogen. We see that as the next step in the energy transformation. Um, and through the electro electrolysis of water, we have the opportunity to uh, convert green electrons into green molecules. 
um, and store that energy and deploy that into hard to decarbonize energy uh, industries and, and road transport. So we're very much looking forward to uh, pursuing the Gigasat project to a, a cleaner, decarbonized future. Thank you. And on my left, Jenny. Uh, my name is Jenny Sutcliffe. I'm the Principal Consultant Regulatory Affairs for Philips 66 in the UK. Um, and so I've been involved with the Gigastack project from a, a kind of a regulatory and a government uh, affairs standpoint and advising on some of the HSC issues, the key HSC issues in, involved with the project. Um, so that's my role. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce you now to Alison Conboy, who is a Deputy Director at Bayes, who's going to give an update on the Bayes hydrogen policy and their next steps. Thank you, Alison. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me today. I'm Alison Conboy, Deputy Director at Bayes for Hydrogen Production, and wanted to speak briefly about the UK government's support for hydrogen. I have a few slides, which I'll share now. So this felt very timely to us. It's been a very big year for hydrogen for the UK government. Um, and I wanted to flag the net zero strategy. I'm sure being at COP, you don't need reminding that this strategy has just been published. Um, but we thought that the role of hydrogen in it was particularly worth pointing out. So for us, this strategy really puts hydrogen into context and um, confirms that we think it's going to be essential for meeting the net zero uh, goal in the UK. And certainly by the 20. By 2050, we're expecting to have quite a lot of hydrogen, so somewhere between 240 and 500 terawatt hours of hydrogen in the UK economy, um, a lot of which will be needed even by the mid 2030s. So we're looking at kind of 80 to 140 terawatt hours of hydrogen there. So for us, it was really good to see the role of hydrogen in the net zero uh, economy starting to kind of lay out. We think we're well positioned to do that, of course, because ahead of the net zero strategy, we had just published the UK's first hydrogen strategy. Um, and this is definitely worth a look if hydrogen's of interest to you. Uh, this lays out a little bit how we see ourselves getting there, and in particular, how we want to get to the UK's ambition of having five gigawatts of installed hydrogen capacity in the UK by 2030 given that we're starting from pretty much near zero base in terms of low carbon hydrogen in the UK, we know that this is going to be demanding and we're really pleased that the strategy and a range of associated consultations starts to lay out, lay out our plans for getting there. One thing I would flag in is this work on the kind of hydrogen roadmap because this starts to lay out how we see the hydrogen economy developing from a kind of slightly smaller scale up to the much larger scale and integrated networks that we're going to need. So this is definitely worth taking a bit of time to look at, and that's in our hydrogen strategy. I wanted to speak a little bit about production technologies too, um, which is to say that we think the UK is really, really well placed to produce hydrogen, and indeed to produce hydrogen from the two most popular methods today, um, which is electrolytic or green hydrogen uh, and kind of blue or CCS enabled hydrogen. And the map on the screen here shows a little bit about the UK's assets. So um, the government's been very clear. We think that the UK has got a lot of assets for both of those technologies. So we have huge potential for renewables, as we know, in the UK. We also have really good assets for CCUS, so CCS storage. Um, and that means that we're really well placed to make use of both of those production routes. Um, and we think both have an important role to play, particularly as they look to our five gigawatts target in 2030. Um, and I wanted to speak a little bit about electrolytic hydrogen in particular. So as I mentioned, we do think this will be essential for meeting that zero. Um, and particularly given the UK government's ambitions to quadruple our capacity for offshore wind, it's clear that the kind of um, renewables driven hydrogen production is going to be just increasingly, like, extremely important in the UK. Um, and I wanted to mention three policy instruments in particular. So one is a hydrogen business model. So something we recognise is if you're a hydrogen producer in the UK, you may be worried about the price 
uh, that that hydrogen will secure, particularly compared to higher carbon counterfeit fuels. Um, you may also be nervous about the volumes that you can sell and the hydrogen business model has been designed with those risks in mind to help manage the price and volume risk uh, for hydrogen producers. And in the net zero strategy, we were able to lay out our plans for starting to allocate that business model. Um, and we've said for electrolytic hydrogen, we're going to have the first round of allocation to be able to allocate up to 250 megawatts of green for electrolytic hydrogen production in 2023. And that's with a view to having 500 megawatts of installed of, of um, hydrogen production from electrolytic production, either installed or in production in construction in 2025. So for us, that's really big to start to lay out their timelines and, and targets for allocating that hydrogen business model. I also wanted to flag the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund. Uh, so this is making available uh, capital co-funding um, and this is £240 million has been announced for that. Um, and again, we hope to have that open at the start of next year and begin to award it to projects that want some government uh, co-funding to build hydrogen production facilities. And then the final thing I was going to mention was the Breakthrough Energy Catalyst. So this is a partnership um, that the Prime Minister and Bill Gates were able to announce and, and wanted to flag that green hydrogen is one of the technologies that that partnership will be focusing on um, and really helping to drive more private sector investment into uh, those low carbon technologies. So we think we've got a really strong policy framework in place in the UK to put us on track to meet our um, very stretching hydrogen production ambitions. We're really pleased that we're not the only ones that are enthusiastic and, and, and so pleased to uh, see that industry is bringing forward really strong pipeline of projects um, to make this a reality. So we really look forward to continuing to work together with industry and, and the range of stakeholders to make the hydrogen economy come together in the UK. So look forward to working with all of you more as this comes together and hope you all enjoy the rest of COP. Thanks. Thank you, Alison. That's great to hear. And we're looking forward to engaging with you over the coming months on our project. Jenny, can I turn back to you um, and ask you to introduce, you've got a Philips 66 video, which is fantastic. And it shows, it probably shows about the offtake and your refinery and how we can bring green hydrogen through and how that can be really used to start to decarbonize in the, in the Humber. Could you maybe introduce your video and then we can have a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Philips 66 Humber refinery has been operating in the UK for more than 50 years, providing, providing essential fuels um, and products. Um, and we're really looking ahead to the next 50 years of operation now. Um, we've played a big part in providing energy uh, to people so far. Um, we're looking at how we can do that going into the future um, through decarbonised operations and decarbonised feedstocks and ultimately products. So um, there's a number of ways in which we can do this um, and we, we talk about this kind of transitioning towards being the refinery of the future. Um, we can do this um, first of all through lower carbon feedstocks, um, uh, recycled oils, um, waste oils uh, and things like that. Um, we can also decarbonise the operations through using, through using hydrogen as um, an energy supply to the refinery and through carbon capture. And we're involved in the development of Humber Zero, which is a carbon capture project really central to the Immingham industrial cluster in the Humber region. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other thing is that the Humber refinery is the only European supplier of graphite coke, um, which is an essential component of electric vehicle batteries. Um, and therefore, again, uh, providing a, a key, uh, key product for the energy transition and decarbonising the whole um, of the UK and achieving net zero. So this video really will give a bit of a flavour of that. OK, thank you. So I think what we'll do is first one.
so we actually haven't built all that yet. That is a, that's a design, and that's what we've been working on through the report, which we will share, which is obviously going live today. And Jenny will come to yours, and then we can see how the Gigastack project, which is what hopefully will look like in the future when we, when we build, uh, and how it will fit within the, it will fit within the Philips 66 refinery. So let's go over to the Philips 66 video. The Philips 66 Humber refinery has been providing energy and improving lives for over 50 years. A major employer in the region, Philips 66 Humber takes its role as a responsible business and good neighbour seriously. Contributing time, expertise and resources to the community, helping improve skills and aspirations and helping to produce a regional talent pipeline. The Philips 66 Humber refinery has a history of caring for the environment and as part of this ethos planted over 80,000 trees covering 110 acres of land neighbouring the refinery to develop a new community woodland. A UK champion and global supplier in the electric vehicle manufacturing supply chain, the Humber refinery is the only facility in Europe capable of manufacturing graphite petroleum coke a specialty and critical component in the production of batteries within both electric vehicles and consumer electronics. Philips 66 supports this with a world-class R&D department, a world leader in premium-grade petroleum coke technology with current UK capability the equivalent to 1.3 million electric vehicles every year. A refinery with proven expertise in new low-carbon fuels in 2017, Humber led the UK in processing used cooking oils, converting waste streams into finished petrol and diesel. In 2020, investing further, trebling its capability. Working with the Department of Transport, we are continuing to develop the next generation of lower carbon fuels, and Humber is ready to start producing the UK's first certified sustainable aviation fuel. Philips 66's Humber Refinery is one of the most energy efficient refineries in Europe, with significant recent investments in reliability, efficiency and environmental improvement projects. With additional investment into energy efficient projects to reduce CO2 emissions and developing new products, bringing new technologies, skills and economic growth to the area. Working in collaboration as part of two significant projects, supporting the Humber and UK's target for net zero, helping to decarbonise critical industry. An ambitious consortium to prove economically viable renewable hydrogen at scale, the Gigastack brings together one of the largest offshore wind farms in the world with the largest carbon emitting industrial zone in the UK on a pathway to net zero, helping to decarbonise large industrial clusters through collaboration. Humber Zero, this industry-led carbon capture project to remove up to 8 million tonnes of CO2 annually by the mid-2020s from the Immingham Industrial Site, helping create a lower carbon future for the region, create new jobs and helping to safeguard 20,000 existing local jobs. Philips 66 Humber Refinery is the UK refinery of the future. Jenny, thank you. What a fantastic video. Um, actually, I was talking to a colleague this morning in, a, in APAC, and he was saying that they're really looking over in APAC about how you can bring forward sort of green hydrogen and hydrogen to start to decarbonise really heavy industry. So I've encouraged him to watch, and I've, in, I've nudged him about your video <laughs> because I think it will really kind of inspire and give some really good th thoughts about it. Now, unfortunately, ITM actually couldn't be in the room with us today. Um, because they're in Sheffield and because they're looking at their new gigafactory. However, Graham Cooley, who is the chief exec of uh, ITM, has shared a video on a virtual tour of their new gigafactory in Sheffield, which is state of the art um, and is fantastic. So we're just going to have a look at that and then we're going to move into a panel session to talk about what we've seen and um, where green hydrogen fits into the world. And Thank you. So welcome everyone to Bessemer Park, the world's largest electrolyzer factory, based in Sheffield in the UK. 
My name's Graham Cooley. I'm the CEO of ITM Power. At Bessemer Park, we manufacture electrolysis equipment and we have a capacity of 1,000 megawatts per annum or a gigawatt per annum. We manufacture PEM electrolyzers. Those are the electrolyzers that you can use to couple directly to renewable power to make green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is the only net zero energy gas and has an incredibly important place in the energy transition. As the world deploys more and more renewable power, so we need more and more energy storage. And the proposition of making green hydrogen using electrolysis is about turning electrons into molecules. Electrons are incredibly difficult to store for very long periods of time. The best way of storing huge amounts of energy for long periods of time is to turn the electrons into green molecules. And that's what you can achieve with electrolysis and the production of green hydrogen. ITM Power has been developing PEM electrolysis equipment for the last 20 years. And we were the first hydrogen related company on the London stock market. And our electrolysis equipment is now being deployed in locations all over the world. And our customers are interested in a number of different important things. They're interested in efficiency. They're interested in current density. They're interested in full system costs and they're interested in performance and lifetime. And at ITM Power, we've developed a technology that's world leading in this area. The electrolysis market is now developing very, very rapidly. If you read the IEA report, which was published in May, you'll see that the IEA is predicting that to get to net zero by 2050, the world needs over three and a half thousand gigawatts of electrolysis. Three and a half thousand gigawatts is 35 centuries of production of this, the world's largest electrolyzer factory. The entry market for hydrogen is industrial hydrogen because that is the existing market today. Today we use 70 million tons of grey hydrogen made by natural gas in industry. So this is in refining, production of ammonia, production of methanol and also in metals fabrication. And that's the market that we begin with. So there are two major stakeholder groups in the whole area of green hydrogen. The first are the renewable energy providers and their interest is in energy storage. Their interest is in turning electrons into molecules which are storable. Those stored molecules then also give them a new product to sell. Rather than just selling green electrons to the electricity grid, they can now sell green molecules to industry. The other key stakeholder group is the oil and gas industry. This is the industry that today provides fossil molecules. And their interest in the future is providing zero carbon footprint molecules. Because of the need to decarbonize industrial gray hydrogen, the applications that we're looking at are increasingly larger in size. And as we scale up in terms of the technology and the module size and also capacity, we are deploying larger and larger electrolysis equipment. In fact, every two years, the size of deployed electrolyzers is increasing by an order of magnitude. That's logarithmic growth in terms of electrolysis deployment. Green hydrogen will play an incredibly important part in the energy transition. And what we're hoping is that the gathering for COP26 in Glasgow helps develop global policy for implementing green hydrogen worldwide. Uh, there's increasing understanding of the use of green hydrogen for energy storage 
and decarbonizing industry. And what we need now is policy to drive the industry forwards. Okay, so thank you, Graham. Thank you for sharing your, your new factory with us. Um, and it's a shame that you can't be with us here, but we're going to discuss around the Gigastack project and where we've got to, what's needed looking ahead and how this fits within the Humber and within the wider UK. So, Alistair, if I can turn to you first. Um, what can you take from the learnings of the Gigastack project that we've been working on so far as a consortium? So the, the launch of today's report is the, the culmination in almost two years of work to explore the regulatory challenges, the commercial challenges, and the technical challenges for deploying large-scale renewable hydrogen at scale. Um, the feed study itself is focused in on examining the challenges and, and the technical solutions to integrating the world's largest offshore wind farm, Hornsey 2, to 100 megawatts of electrolyzer capacity, um, which will then feed uh, renewable hydrogen into the Humber refinery. And I think for me, the, the biggest achievement that's come out of this report is that this report and the study has demonstrated that this technology is ready to move forward. It's technolo technologically advanced enough to move into um, production almost. And, and we're very much looking forward to working with government on policy and regulatory frameworks to enable this project to move forward to the next stage um, and secure or reach an FID in perhaps early 2023. Okay, that's excellent and how exciting. Um, thank you. And if I turn to yourself, Jenny, from the work that Philip 66 are working within a consortium, and this is an unusual consortium to bring together. It's, it's not you know, with a renewable developer and a, a sort of a, a refinery off-taker and a supplier of electrolyzers. This is an unusual consortium, the first of a kind, I would say, for a flagship project. What's Philip 66 taken and learned from this project? Well, it has been really, really interesting to work in the consortium. Like you say, there's such different expertise um, and seeing that come together, what the different companies and what the different people bring together, we're kind of really trying to match up technologies that have previously been kind of separate and independent, trying to make them work together. So that's been really, really interesting. Um, uh, and Philip 60, I, I'm not sure I can add much on what Alistair said really. I mean, we've identified the pathway. There is a technological route. This can be developed, this can be deployed. Um, and now we just need to try and make that happen. And we will make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <That's very good. laughs> Claire, from your perspective, yeah. I mean, we're involved in the project, but from your perspective, from the, an outside in, how do you see that sort of gigastacks fitting within the mm. wider UK ambition for green hydrogen? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I spend a lot of my time talking to people about hydrogen, you know, whether that's people within industry, government, or the poor, unfortunate person who has the misfortune of sitting next to me on the train. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, once we've got sort of past the sort of basics and I've lectured them for half an hour on why hydrogen is a really important part of the energy mix and why we can't uh, reach net zero without it, inevitably at some point I will get asked the questions, how much hydrogen can we produce and what's it going to cost? Um, and we know that we need to scale green hydrogen production rapidly in this country. You know, if we look at the Committee on Climate Change or the National Grid scenarios, um, we basically need to build a sort of hydrogen energy system that's roughly the size of the power domain today. Um, that means we need a lot of hydrogen and we need it in a very short space of time. And it's got to be clean and it's got to be affordable. Um, and so the Gigastack project is really great because it starts to answer some of these questions um, that yes, we can scale green hydrogen and yes, we can get it to a place where it's going to be affordable. Um, I think there's another sort of a few aspects that I'd also just sort of like to draw out. Um, you know, we have some really important um, industries in this country, you know, that Jenny was talking about, you know, creating, um, compo creating materials and, and um, products for electric battery vehicles, electric vehicle batteries. Um, you know, we've got cement, we've got glass, we've got steel. You know, these are industries that keep the UK going and also are supporting local communities with jobs. Um, in a net zero world, we basically have two options for these industries. Um, either we have to decarbonize them or they're gonna disappear. And we don't want to lose the industrial heart of this country. And that means that we, need, we have a responsibility to provide clean hydrogen to these industries to allow them to um, decarbonize. Um, and I guess the, the sort of last thing that I just wanted to, to draw out is this is an amazing opportunity. Um, you know, the, the global race for hydrogen is happening as we speak. And the UK has an opportunity to take a leadership role. 
um, ensuring that the sort of jobs and the economic benefit that is going to be generated by this sort of emerging opportunity is realised here in the UK. Um, we did some, some work last year and um, by 2035, so that's 15 year, or 14 years time, nearly 13 years time now, um, we sort of estimated that green hydrogen could generate 1.4 billion of GVA and 18,000 jobs in the UK. Um, so if we can sort of push the policies forward to enable this industry to emerge, then there's a huge economic opportunity as well as being able to deliver sort of deep decarbonisation in a sort of cost-effective and affordable manner. So Gigastack is right at the heart of um, everything that we need to do in terms of meeting net zero. Thank you. Well, that's a resounding... Uh, uh, it's a big thumbs up for Gigastack. Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. From the outside in as well. It's not us talking to ourselves. <laughs> I think from Ersted we certainly see um, our mantra is about a world that runs on green energy, but I think we certainly see that it's our role as well, our role our, to help other companies decarbonise. When we look at somewhere like the Humber, to help the Humber decarbonise, there is the steel, there's the cement, there's all those heavy industries there, and it's part of what we need to do. We need to work together. One of the bits, I was at COP last week, and, and one of the bits that really struck me was about how how much about getting to net zero is about the collaborative process of mm. us all together. And we're not going to get there. No one person can get there on their own. So we have to work together. We have to find ways and the synergies between us. That's absolutely right. I think, you know, net zero is this big puzzle piece. It's a big yeah. puzzle. And actually, everyone's got a different piece. Um, and actually, un unless we all bring the different components, actually, we're not going to make that big sort of net zero picture. You're absolutely right. Collaboration is right at the heart of what we need to do to meet net zero. So somebody described to me last week, and I'm going to apologize because I actually can't remember his name, but I was at an event last week. He described it like a Rubik's Cube. You know where you have the Rubik's Cube where you have the different yeah. colors on each side? So everyone has to get their colors to match up with the next one. And actually, that's the net zero puzzle eventually. And I thought that was a fantastic kind of visualization of how you kind of how we work together to get all the pieces to fit so you can't we can't all just do it on our own we do it together and it looks a bit messy before you get there it looks a bit messy <laughs> and actually personally I'd never get there if it's left to me <laughs> <laughs> but you may be able to give it to a five-year-old which maybe is what's going on and be able to work it out very quickly <laughs> so Jenny coming on to that so why is I mean, maybe that's obvious, but why is Gigastack? Why did we choose, or why did you choose the Humber? You're based in the Humber, but why was Gigastack and this consortium particularly of interest to Philip 66? Well, the Humber region is the largest industrial region in the UK um, and also is extremely well placed to benefit because of that, because you've got such a, a diversity and scale of industry in the region, but you've also got the development of Orsted's uh, wind farms in the North Sea. Um, it's also very strategically located to uh, s potential carbon storage solutions in the North Sea. So for carbon capture, again, it's a, a really good area to be in where um, that network could build out. Um, and again, from a hydrogen perspective, uh, hydrogen is, is is one of is one of really the only solutions for decarbonizing the some of the harder to get energy sources at the refinery and so gigastack really brings together um, some key elements to provide that decarbonization that wouldn't be so um, wouldn't come together quite so well in other regions um, we're part of the Humber industrial cluster plan and that's looking at the wider region um, as well looking at the decarbonisation of the region and how industry can really link together and build out those networks. So um, Gigastack really provides that first stepping stone. Um, the industrial offtake for you know the ref refinery taking that hydrogen is kind of a secure offtake for the meantime before uh, you know before that the hydrogen really develops and deploys at scale and you know is used at fueling station before networks actually develop and the industrial offtaker is really that consistent supply that allows it to build out and it's that first stepping stone so um, I think that's what the Gigastack project will really give us. Okay great and I know that, that as you said you're mentioning about the the Humber the blue sort of hydrogen that's being developed as well it's, a, it's about us all working together again with the blue and the green and I think Bayes approach is to take a twin track approach um, to make sure we develop both at the same time, make sure we move forward with everything um, and yeah. drive down the cost and drive it out into the, out into the wider world. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there really is multiple solutions out there, but it's important that we really do um, push for green hydrogen and um, get that renewable hydrogen, yeah. uh, get that started. So uh, yeah, the, the Gigastack is the, the leading project in the UK for that. Okay, thank you. 
And Alistair, if we look at other, uh, from a Ersted or from an offshore wind renewable, um, obviously there's an ambition to bring on 40 gigawatts by 2030, which is a huge amount. I mean, yeah. we're, doubling, we're doubling the amount of offshore wind that we have on the system at the moment. Um, and certainly we'll be looking at sort of battery storage and green hydrogen to help manage that, that huge amount of offshore wind that's coming on. Are you able to talk a little bit more about that and about how we're approaching it or how it's being approached by the renewable industry? Yeah, so that topic of system integration is, is key to the build out of further renewable assets. Um, as you say, the, the, the 2030 target is, is massive um, and there's a real risk that as we move through with the build out of renewables, there will be periods of time where periods of time during high wind speeds that we'll need to curtail those renewable assets because there won't be adequate demand. Now, renewable hydrogen can act as that flexible demand. It can pick up those megawatt hours um, when they're being produced and convert that green energy into um, and store it in the form of renewable hydrogen so that it can be deployed in industrial activity uses or heavy transport activities and decarbonize those sectors that would otherwise not lend themselves to direct electrification. Okay, so it's kind of like a win-win situation. Very much so. It will keep the cost of renewables down by keeping them running, basically. Yeah. And I think, Claire, have you been looking at some of, the, some of this area about the, how we manage that renewable power coming on and some of the... Yeah, I mean, we look at it right from, right from the sort of the, the primary energy source, whether that's wind or solar or whatever it might be, all the way down through to um, whoever it might be that needs to use hydrogen. Um, and actually, it's important that we keep that whole big energy system in, um, in our in our minds as we're looking at this. Um, you know, there's many areas where if you, um, you know, you zoom in and you look at a particular use case, you know, hydrogen does make sense. But actually, hydrogen is the most compelling when you sort of zoom out and you look at the impact that it has on our energy system by providing that flexibility, providing that storage mechanism, and also providing a mechanism by which we can move a lot of energy around. You know, the the reality is is that no one's using energy in the North Sea. They're generating it there, but actually you've got to get it to the place where it needs to be used. And hydrogen's a really good mechanism, a really use a good energy vector, we say, um, for getting energy from the point where it's actually being generated and produced to the point where um, we actually need to use it. So it's a really, really important tool within our energy system, or it will be once <laughs> in the future, <laughs> the future energy system when we can't use um, chemical energy carriers like methane. I, I think we're on the cusp of something fantastic at the moment, actually. Oh, yeah, it's I, hugely I, exciting. It's, it's really, really exciting. I certainly, I worked in the mobile, people know I worked in the mobile phone industry before I came into the energy world, and we're on the cusp of the iPhone and sort of like all that world of just as you kind of like bring broadband and Wi-Fi and all those things. And actually, that's what's really, I really feel that's what we're about to go through. And it's going so fast. It's going so fast. We can barely get everything out quick yeah. enough and be able to move quick enough. So we yeah. need to, you know, we need to organise together and kind of move forwards. And I That's think what I, mantra, move forwards. And I think what <laughs> I find really exciting as well is we genuinely have world-leading projects here in the UK. Yeah. Um, you know, the rest of the world is looking at the UK and going, you know, we've got to catch up with these guys. Yeah. You know, we've we've got to keep our sort of foot to the pedal to actually make sure that we are we are pushing forwards because you know everyone is hot on our heels. But we've got some really genuinely world-leading projects in the UK, Gigastack amongst them. So. Um, it is a really exciting time to be working in, in the sort of hydrogen space in the UK. Yeah. And I think actually Bayes knows that because that's mm -hmm. why they're funding hydrogen projects and it's certainly why they're going to have the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund, um, which they're going to be opening up early next year, hopefully. Yeah, and you know, policy's come a long way in the last 12 months. You know, 12 months ago we had no UK hydrogen strategy. Um, we didn't really know what the sort of government's plans were for supporting um, the sort of rollout of, of hydrogen. So we've come an awfully long way, but there is still an awfully long way to go. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, having now we have the UK hydrogen strategy that we really focus on how we're actually going to deliver it. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of challenges still to overcome. There's a lot of policy gaps where we need sort of policy and policymakers to sort of step up and 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 actually start to make these projects happen. You know, we've got we've got it in the planning stages, but actually there's some really key steps before that we actually see it in reality. So um, important that we sort of work closely with government over the next 12 months to actually move these projects from planning to actually delivery. Yeah, and we should acknowledge actually amount the amount of work we've had to do virtually, and in mm. fact. Claire, we've worked together quite <laughs> yes. a bit over the last year and a half, two years. We met today. Um, and we've met first time today. The same for, yeah. for Jenny. We've, we've met online a few times, but today's the first time 
um, we've actually met properly yeah. uh, in real life in 3D, in fact, for all of us. So, <laughs> you know, and this might be the only time for the next six months, so we're oh, making the most not. of it. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I hope not. No, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so, Jenny, you were speaking before about the, the, you know, the GVA, the jobs that, you know, that have been, you yeah. know, the work that we've done through the Gigastat projects and where that's would you like to speak a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, and so uh, the Gigastat will create 180 jobs um, and add 270 million of GVA to the local economy. That is the 100 megawatt case. And then there are actual further scale up options that would add even more. Um, and to touch on something that Claire mentioned earlier, this is really essential. We, there's, there's no point the driving industry out of the UK. Um, it really uh, is a case of trying to keep that industry, keep that expertise. We have so much that we can um, do to achieve net zero um, and grow the economy, develop industry, do go for a green industrial revolution at the same time. So um, that's really what we are working on. But it, again, it's an essential piece to the decarbonisation of the region, which will safeguard um, likely many, many more jobs. Which is essential to the government policy about the levelling up in, in you know, through yeah. as we move into a, a sort of net zero economy and the green jobs that it will bring and the transition to green jobs, the apprentices. So Absolutely. it's actually about all those bits about, I don't yeah. know how many chemical engineers we're going to need and apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot. We're going to need a lot. <laughs> well, that's the key issue, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, people think that these, you know, that they're not necessarily incentivized to go into the science, technology, engineering and math subjects, your STEM subjects, but, and, and they see industry as potentially being kind of a, a, an, a, like against a net zero economy. So actually we really, really need mm. people to be excited about this and to go into those, into those subjects and go into those industries um, to really achieve it and yeah. get to yeah. net zero. And, but I think that's where government strategy is so important to give people that line of sight around what industries are going to be active and where, where there's going to be growth in the economy in the years to come. And I think that's why we welcome these net zero strategy documents which outline the, the, the future growth opportunities in these industries. Yeah, yeah, and I'm hoping that we bring forward a really diverse workforce into the in the future mm -hmm. in a lot of areas because I think it's how we're going to have to be we're going to have to be really really creative. We can't keep doing the same things we've been doing for the last fifty or hundred years. We've got to be really creative in yeah. how we approach these problems, and we need lots and lots of different ways of thinking in order to really kind of challenge ourselves mm -hmm. to get to get to the the right answer. This is not easy. I know it's easy to say about net zero twenty fifty. But I think it's it's really going to be quite. It's a challenge. Uh, it's an exciting challenge. It's an it's exciting challenge, but it is a massive challenge, and it's not to be underestimated. Um, I've you know been chatting to a lot of people recently about you know what's the difference. We, we used to have an eighty percent target, and now we've got a net zero target. And you kind of think it's just like more of the same, but actually that last twenty percent was that all of those things that before we didn't really have to worry about. We kind of put them in the like. Too, too hard, we'll deal with that at some point in the future. <laughs> but now we've got to deal with all of it. And I often like to describe it to people a little bit like a ketchup bottle. You know, that first bit comes flying out. <laughs> but that last, that last bit at the bottom, you know, you've got to put a lot of effort into getting those last sort of little bits out. Um, and so we need to be really focused. We need to have a skilled workforce that is, you know, motivated and excited about this. And we need, you know, we need more people coming into the green sector. So. Um, really important that we're all sort of pulling together on this one. Yeah. And Thank that's you. really the interesting thing about consortiums like this and, and the whole topic really. Um, I think so much of my time I spend in these consortiums or on some of the calls that bays are running or whatever it is and most of the time I'm thinking I'm not really sure about that. Is that because I just don't know it and I should know it or is that because it, you know it's something that we're not sure about and I tend to charge in and ask the questions anyway but so much of the time that's really kind of leading to useful discussions now I think that's really important and when you do have such a diverse consortium like we have you need to you need to at, be asking those questions having those discussions and working through the problems mm. and it has been a challenge at times I think you know we have with very, very different interests. And this is going to be what we're going to be doing as we go forward. Yeah, so. and, and I'm going to get on my hobby horse here a little bit. but <laughs> oh, please um, do. <laughs> <laughs> keeps it entertaining anyway. <laughs> you know, I think we've we sometimes digress into this debate within the energy within the energy sort of sector of is it electrification or is it hydrogen? And you end up in this very, um, in many ways, pointless and counterproductive debate around um, you know, the relative merits of these two sort of decarbonisation pathways. Um, and the reality is we need them both. 
um, and they are wonderfully complementary towards to, to each other. Um, and actually, you know, what the final energy mix is going to look like in 2050, who knows? And quite frankly, like, I'm not really that worried about that at the moment. We'll have a better idea in 10 years' time about what it's going to look like in 2050. But we know we need all of these various different solutions. And so we need to push forward with urgency with, with, with all of them. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my two cents on the, the, some of the debates that happen in the energy sector at the moment. Let's do, let's do it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... Uh... Maybe on Monday. Maybe <laughs> yeah. when we've got back from Glasgow on yeah, the weekend. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll start that after the weekend. <laughs> I think let them finish the COP first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just as we wrap up, um, and thank you, thank you for your time this morning. Um, and apologies again about the delay to start. Uh, can I just ask, just go around and basically, so Alistair, what would you like to, what do you think from a gigastat perspective, what do we need to progress the project? So in terms of next steps, um, I think any first of a kind project will need some degree of regulatory and policy support to oust the incumbent technology. And I think we're hugely supportive and grateful for the work that Bayes are doing at the moment with their uh, Net Zero Hydrogen Fund and the Hydrogen Business Model. Um, but we are concerned that the rate of progress won't allow these projects to be deployed in the timescale that we all want and aspire them. So um, what we would encourage is, uh, and, and endorse really is that the, the government were to um, engage in sort of bilateral discussions um, with the GIGASAT project and, and other renewable hydrogen developers so that we can bring these projects online quicker. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Jenny, what would be your next step or your, your ask be? Um, so we, we need a, a clear pathway to the business model, as Alistair um, alludes to. Um, the, the work that's done to date that is covered by the, the launch of the report is a significant amount of work. There is still some more to do, um, engineering, development, planning, permitting, um, to get to a final investment decision. And that needs to be done really in parallel with a um, with discussions on the, the business model, um, which is also needed uh, before a final investment decision. So really that's it. Again, it's just uh, the, the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund and the business models that Bayes are working on are very, very promising. But again, it's just making sure that that does um, allow us to achieve our 2025 target for commercial operation of the GigaStack. Um, also encourage that we've seen some other potential funding mechanisms coming forwards from Green Hydrogen in the last month. So it's just a case of trying to understand if they have any, um, what that means for GigaStack. But uh, yeah, it's just really important that we maintain the momentum. Okay, thank you, Jenny. And Claire, to wrap us up. Yeah, so I think I think we need we need a number of things. You're absolutely right. We need the business models to come forward as fast as is humanly possible. Um, we need some more detailed policy and regulatory instruments to drive demand in end use sectors, um, both industrial and, and beyond. Um, we need to start thinking about how we're going to link supply and demand, so investment in infrastructure and, and hydrogen storage. Um, we need to start doing some stuff around skills and jobs and actually um, building that capability, ensuring that we have that skilled workforce. And we also need to take people with us. You know, this is this is something that we need to do as a as a country. Um, you know, hygiene is going to impact and intersect with people's lives, um, and so we need to start widening the conversation around hydrogen as well. Um, yeah, that's a few things from me. No, that's fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you for coming along this morning to have the discussion, and. We have a GigaStack website where the report will be uploaded, so anyone can go and download it. We've got a Twitter feed as well, and we may have other things, but I'm not entirely sure. But there's a, there's a GigaStack website, and there's a, there's a report there, so please feel free to go and download. Thank you for your time this morning.